can be tempting to think that random sampling techniques are good and non-random sampling techniques are bad. Please don't fall into that trap. In many cases, in most cases, it is better to use a random sampling technique if you possibly can. However, there will be times when random sampling is just not possible. That is why we have non-random sampling techniques. Let me show you one that is very useful in some specific research situations. It's called judgment sampling. With judgment sampling, you find an expert on the subject matter that you want to study, and you allow that person to select participants or elements of the population that he or she feel are most representative of the population. This form of sampling can be highly accurate and have minimal bias. When would you want to use judgment sampling? We want to research ethical hackers. There's lots of hackers, some of whom are considered ethical. But who are they? If we have an expert in the field, someone with deep knowledge and experience in the field, that person might be able to tell us. We could rely on that person's judgment in a way that we simply could not make a decision ourselves. Or we're researching religion, and we want to talk to people who are true believers. Who truly belongs to this religion? We might need to find an expert, someone who can make that judgment for us of the people, the kinds of people who should be included in our sample, and more specifically, which individuals should be excluded. We may not be able to make that judgment ourselves, and so we rely on the expertise of a judge to tell us who can and cannot, should or should not be included. Who are the most representative individuals for this population? The advantage of using judgment sampling is that it is an easy way to select a sample. We let someone else do all the work. On the other hand, the quality of your sample will depend upon the quality of your expert's judgment. It is up to you as a researcher to identify a judge who can accurately tell you which individuals are truly representative of this population. Let's look at one more non-random sampling technique. This is a technique that you can use in a situation where random sampling wouldn't work, and it's called snowball sampling. Snowball sampling begins with a primary data source, a beginning individual or perhaps a small group of individuals. The primary data source then nominates other potential participants, and so your sample grows and grows just like rolling a snowball down the hill, with each new participant nominating other potential participants to add to your research pool. And this is a very popular technique for business researchers. You may start with a small group of people that you know and ask them to refer you to others whom they know. What are circumstances in which you should use snowball sampling techniques? The first would be when you do not have a data frame. You want to do research on homeless individuals or country club members. In both cases, you might not have access to all of those individuals. You might not be able to get in. And so having one primary data source who could make those introductions might make this research possible. Or you could use snowball sampling when participants are difficult to find. You're doing research on victims of a very rare disease. People who are experiencing this condition often reach out to others for support during this time, and as a result would have contacts with other individuals sharing that same diagnosis to whom they could refer you as part of your research. Snowball sampling works well when your research population is a stigmatized population, such as studying sex workers, or assault victims, or HIV patients. These are people who might not want to identify themselves, but would trust someone else whom they know 
if that person referred you to them. Similarly, members of a population who have intense interest in self-protection, cult members, extremist groups, terrorists, or studying members of the CIA or the FBI. In each of these cases, the individuals as part of that group don't want others to know who they are. However, they may trust someone that they know as a referral source, allowing you, as a researcher, access to a population that you might not otherwise have. There are advantages and disadvantages to snowball sampling. The primary advantage is simplicity. It will be much easier for you to find participants using the snowball sampling technique. Convenience. It's cost effective, it's inexpensive. And utility. You can find participants who you might not otherwise. But there are disadvantages as well. A primary being sampling error. Referrals tend to be more similar to the referrer than they are to others, giving you a sample that is less generalizable than it might otherwise be. And of course, another disadvantage, lack of cooperation. There will be people who, despite that referral, will decline to participate, which somewhat limits your sample and introduces some sampling error of its own.